Jonathan Fallon. Michael Berris for here, guys. Welcome to today's Wealth Mod. Investing interstate. Ooh, investing interstate. How can I be comfortable? So we're going to talk today about how to be comfortable and <clears throat> be as secure investing in a taking an investment property in another capital city when really I'm I've lived in Melbourne my whole life. I don't travel much, mate. I don't I don't know Brisbane can. Why would I buy an investment in Brisbane? There you go. Don't know Perth. So yeah. So let's go through the fundamentals. Firstly, I suppose why, mate? Why are we going to invest in a different capital city. So two yeah. sets, I'll grab a N. So why do we invest in multiple capital cities? Um, most people, boys, get serious about investing at about age, late 20s, let's say 30, mate. Um, let's, uh, let's look at someone's lifestyle, 50. But generally, people feel comfortable in today's, like when it's time for retirement, um, really, you start getting serious about you know your financial goals. Let's say give them give them thirty. Some people are a little bit smarter. Yep. Get to forty and fifty. Really, if you think property doubles in the capital cities about every say you know let's give a worst case ten years. Yep. Really, if we invest in let's say we're Melbourne boys, so we invest in Melbourne. We've got one, two growth cycles. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, five hundred k turns into one mil, turns into two mil. Very basic. Yeah. Nothing wrong with doubling your portfolio value, yeah, twice over that period of time. But obviously, um, property cycles, markets um, as they cycle, and tend to do this not perfectly, but uh, yeah, thereabouts. Obviously, this period here to here is one market cycle, and that's basically seen as one market cycle. Obviously, once we've got a bit of growth in one capital city, say Melbourne. We'd like to be able to jump back into, say, Brisbane or Perth or Sydney, whatever it may be. In effect, what we're doing is Melbourne, once we've got a bit of growth to this point, we might buy in Brisbane, see a bit more growth. So really we've got one growth cycle, two growth cycles, three growth cycles, four, yeah. So basically what we're trying to do is compound the amount of growth cycles that we can have over your 20, 30 year investment journey. Yeah? So, ba so basically what you're saying, Cam, instead of having all of your properties in one capital city yep. that get two lots of growth yep. in a 20 year period. If you can spread your portfolio across three capital cities or four capital cities, then you're essentially getting six or eight lots of growth cycles in the same time frame. Much better. Yeah. Ride the perfect wave. Point break, is it? <laughs> yeah. Well, the per perfect summer, the endless summer. <laughs> the perfect wave. In that's effect. It. In effect. So, it still that, doesn't change the fact that I don't well. know Brisbane. Yeah, that's all good and well. So, right. how do we do that? So how do we get across it? Initially when purchasing, so let's have a look first of all about um, the, the work required. Now we talked in, in earlier on um, about Arnold Schwarzenegger, go and work your butt off. Mm -hmm. Most people work um, you know, 40 hours plus in a job for someone else um, and aren't really putting, aren't doing that extra amount of spending the extra time to build property portfolios. That's so, right. Yeah. What's required, and it's crazy. I mean, people say someone earns, you know, what's the average wage nowadays? Say 90 grand. Say 90 grand, average wage nowadays, that's, that's a pretty good wage. So you're working for 40 hours a week for $90,000, yet you won't go and spend you know, 10 hours flying into state and doing the, the work, driving around. So over four weekends, spending the money, you know, whatever it is, 500 bucks of uh, you know, flights and accommodation to go and investigate different capital cities. Yeah. Yes, there's work to be done, but the reality is, if you can get six or eight growth cycles as opposed to two over that period, is spending four weekends and you know, 5,000 bucks worthwhile? Hell yeah, very much so. So you gotta do the work. Yeah. If you can't do the work, understand if there's someone in that capital city that can do the work for you, which is what I do, so. Exactly right. Oh, so once we've um, identified, obviously, um, the reason we go through this and go back to the map, so map process to understand which markets to invest in, to understand which markets to be flying to investigating, then it's a matter of getting comfortable with each. I probably break cities down into to regions mm -hmm. you know, or corridors, so growth yeah. corridors, so um, northern, south, um, you know, west of Brisbane, Melbourne's got you know a good three, um, and yeah, Perth's obviously a weird shape thing on it. <laughs> <laughs> Sydney's yeah got a few going, but really once you break areas down into those corridors, you can start looking at the population growth versus supply in each of those, and it's a matter of literally knocking out ones that have got an oversupplied and under um, undersupplied population growth forecast. Yep. So once you get to that point, then you got to get down to suburbs. So how do you get down to suburbs by the side? And it's difficult because usually 
someone will tell you a suburb and you get a bit of emotional attachment to that. Yeah. Um, how do we get it down to the point of you know, being comfortable with an area and then once we've got that property, how do we spend our time managing that portfolio? Yeah, cool. So the way we don't do it is look at where the new Coles shopping centre is going because That's by right. itself, in isolation, a Coles shopping centre is not going to get you capital growth in a hurry or a new school. So all the things that we call amenities. Yeah, Amenities are important, but they're not the primary thing that we focus on. The first thing that you want to do when you're driving around is assess the undersupply. So are we in an existing suburb? You know, we're not in a paddock where there's bucket loads of, of, of developable land. We want to be, you know, in amongst existing houses. Um, we want to have a scarcity of land because it's a pretty basic dynamic. Um, undersupply with a lot of demand drives prices up. Um, so we look for a stable population. The easiest way to do that is to look for diverse um, employment areas. Yep. So, um, you know, mining towns are the classic example. One major employer, the buying stops or the employer leaves, um, not a great result. So we don't want, you know, if a business or two shuts or a business or two opens, we don't want to be riding that wave of volatility in terms of population in and population out. We want stable capital cities where yep. there's local employment and easy accessibility to, to CBDs or principal activity centres, which are the way that the state governments are going these days, where they're basically creating hubs of, uh, of local employment and also of amenities. So what you're, what you're um, illustrating there is, was when you mentioned earlier about not buying where the new coals is going in, you want to identify the supply and demand, which will tell you you want to buy before the coals goes in. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, because the population will come first, people pay their rates, exactly. then the council has the ability to be able to provide amenity and infrastructure. So it's about having a bit of foresight, you know, Arnie's thing about break the rules, step away from the mould, have the conviction to say, well, this is a set of criteria that is going to work for me. Um, by the time the market started to boom, you're too late. You want to be coming in here and then taking advantage of that upswing. Yeah. On the website, there's a check sheet you can use to select area, so the market's area of property, so you can download for free from the website. Let's say we've actually got comfortable enough where we've purchased a property in a capital city which is outside of Melbourne, for example, mate. Yep. How do we manage that? That's a long way away. What if the tenant rings up and tells me the toilet's broken? Okay. Two key words. Property managers. Um, experts in doing what they do. So they're really your eyes and your ears and your day-to-day -day, um, problem solvers when it comes to the property. So um, the less I hear from my property manager, I've got great ones, the less I hear from them, the happier I am because I know that they've either just solved the problem or there's nothing going wrong. Um, and you know, typically it's once a month you get your rental statement from them and you're like, oh, that's right, you know, those guys are working for me. Um, save yourself the headache, guys. There's legislation you need to understand. It gets complex. Let them deal with the tenants. Pay a little bit for it. It's tax deductible. Um, frees up your time to actually do what you enjoy doing. Having said that, if you are the kind of person that likes to see and touch and just, especially early on in your journey, get some peace of mind around your investment, go and inspect it. As soon as you've got rental income being generated from that property, you get an inspection annually that can be tax deductible if the purpose of that trip is to see the property. So take a photo of it, have a time and date stamp, align that with your airfares and your accommodation, tax deduction on your, uh, on your inspection. Now, I guarantee you one thing, if you go and see it twice or three or four times a year, it's not gonna go up in value any quicker. So make sure you're going for the right reasons. But if, it, if that's a comfort thing that helps you early on, Go for it, but uh, I saw a couple of my early ones once a year for the first two years, and haven't seen them in ten years since. So not you get sick of it pretty quick. Yeah, not that um, not that I don't disclose everything to Felicity about our investment journey, but she would have no idea about some of the properties we've got. Here's, here's a good, here's a good one. So I was driving through one of the northern suburbs. This is a, a couple of years ago actually. Driving through one of the um, northern suburbs of Brisbane in Warner, it actually was Warner Lakes. Um, I snapped a photo of one of the homes we've got in that um, that area. We've got a number of properties in that area, and I texted to her and said, "Here's one of our properties in in Warner Lakes." She texted me back and she said, "Can you t go around and drive around?" I'd actually left by the time uh, I sent it to her. She said, "Can you drive in front of um, Claire's house?" So this is Felicity's sister, my sister-in-law. Can you drive in front of Claire and Aaron's house and take a photo of theirs? I was looking at it going, really, does it matter? So I sent a text back going, "Just send them our photo and just tell them it's their house." So. <laughs> While you do need to have a little bit more um, you know, due diligence in it, obviously they're comfortable enough that they hadn't even seen their house, you know, first of all. So 
once you get comfortable, I've got many properties that I've never seen, um, like yourself. Likewise. Yeah, so it's a matter of once you're comfortable investing in, in interstate, you can get to the point where you can purchase without seeing or become comfortable enough that the property's there, manager's looking after it, don't want to know any more about it. Exactly right. Cool. Cheers, guys. See you, guys.